Good evening. I am Diane Richards, Executive Director of the Harlem Writers Guild. On behalf of the Center for Black Literature and the Harlem Writers Guild, we welcome you to this evening's John Oliver Killen's Reading Series program. Tonight's event kicks off the Center's John Oliver Killen's Reading Series for the 2021 fall season. And we are delighted to be partnering with the Center for a discussion on the recent release of John Oliver Killen's novel written in the 1960s, The Minister Primarily. Let me share with you something about the Harlem Writers Guild. The Harlem Writers Guild was founded in 1950 in Harlem by John Oliver Killens, Rosa Gee, Dr. John Henry Clark, and other writers. They held meetings in a building at 125th Street and Lenox Avenue, and later on in John Oliver Killens' home and other writers' homes. Hmm. Their primary purpose, and this is very important, was to create literary works reflective of their lives and to level the playing field of publishing. In the Harlem Writers Guild, Black writers and artists find support and opportunities among each other. Now come and reminisce with me a little bit. Imagine a meeting room in the 1950s at 125th and Lenox Avenue on the corner, second floor, around a table is Harry Belafonte, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee, Sidney Portier, Dr. John Henry Clark, Rosa Gee, Walter Christmas, Willard Moore, Lorraine Hansberry, and James Baldwin is just hanging out. And of course, there's our John Oliver Killens with his agenda. What a powerhouse creative storm that was. Now, this is just my imagination, but I did my best. Belafonte was a mentor to John Oliver Killens, paving his way to write Hollywood films. Maya Angelou was encouraged by John Oliver Killens to move to New York to pursue her writing career. Under John Oliver Killens' leadership, the Harlem Writers Guild was a part of the Black arts movement of the 1960s, supporting Black artistic expression in all genres. Today, the Harlem Writers Guild is in its 70th year since John Oliver Killens, Rosa Gee, and Dr. John Hendrick Clark met. We carry their legacy of supporting Black writers. We know that the support of Black writers for one another is unparalleled. This evening's roster of respected and renowned writers is an example of Black writers supporting one another. And that leads me to introduce a woman who is so incredible to so many writers because she supports them. I want to introduce you to Dr. Brenda M. Green. Dr. Green is a scholar, educational leader, author, literary artist, and radio host. She is a professor, a founder, and executive director of the Center for Black Literature and director of the National Black Writers Conference at Megar Evers College, CUNY. Her educational leadership, professional accomplishments, and scholarship include essays, grants, book reviews, and presentations in African American literature and multicultural literature. She is the editor of the African Presence and Influence on the Culture of the Americas and co-editor of Resistance and Transformation Conversations with Black Writers. Good evening, Dr. Green. Good evening, Diane. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and welcome and greetings to all of our guests. 
uh, special, especially to our speakers, Maya Leica Adiro, Arthur Flowers, Keith Gilliard, Ishmael Reed, and S. Pearl Sharp. And welcome to the Megar Evers College community. We are very, very pleased to have with us today the first woman president of Megar Evers College, Dr. Patricia Ramsey. Uh, she said something in the chat and I encourage her to continue to speak in the chat. I'd also like to acknowledge our vice presidents, Vice President Kimberly Whitehead for um, strategy and Vice President Jesse Kane for student enrollment and retention. I also would like to welcome our students, faculty and staff at Mega Rivers College, our CUNY colleagues, our Mega Rivers College friends, our program partners for the Center for Black Literature, the Preservation um, Long Island Project, the Jupiter Hammond Project, the Brooklyn Reader, the Elm C City Lit Festival, our advisory board members for the Center for Black Literature, Louise, Dr. Louise Mirror and Rich Jones, our partner and friend, Novella Ford from the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. Thank you so much for helping us to make this a successful program and for sharing in the celebration of John Oliver. I also would like to especially Holland Writers Guild. I loved your, your historical um, presentation on the Holland Writers Guild. Many people don't know about it and it's significant. So thank you for sharing that, uh, Diane. And I, I think your imagination really speaks to it. I'd like to thank Harper Collins who came to us and asked us to uh, bring this program to you, the Amazon Literary Partnership, and also Troy Johnson, who is president and founder of the African American Literature Book Club. The book is available online, The Minister Primarily. Patrick Bass, who edited The Minister Primarily, he is also to be acknowledged. Please make sure and visit the website of the African American Book a literature book club to purchase the book. We have to support our writers. Um, and a special acknowledgement to Barbara Killens, the daughter of John Oliver Killens. She is helping to ensure that the legacy of John Oliver Killens can. We cannot forget the Center for Black Literature Consultants, our director, Clarence Reynolds, our project manager, Amber Magruder, our Director of Communications and, Mar and Marketing, April Silver, our Program Associate, Leah Bird, and our Virtual Events Manager, Simone Wow. These are really, really challenging times. Writers such as Killens offer us a way to remember that we have to study and think about the challenges we continually face. They shed light on political and social issues. And we're so pleased to pay tribute to John Oliver Killens in this way. He is the visionary leader of the National Black Writers Conference, which was begun at Mega Evers College in 1986. He's a, he was a dynamic force in the literary community, and we honor him through our Killens reading series and through our magazine, the Killens Re Review of Arts and Letters. We have used this text in our programs and in our courses. We have ensured that there's a way for scholars to present his work. And it is really, really special that the friends and mentees of Killens are here with us today. Each of the speakers has a special relationship with John Oliver Killens, and I really look forward to hearing from them. I had the opportunity to meet John Oliver Killens when he was writer in residence at Megar Evers College. He always encouraged writers and people from the community to meet at the college on Saturdays in his writing workshop. He was a soft-spoken man, but he was a dynamic force. Now, a word about the minister primarily. Killens was a master at dialogue, irony, and satire. And his novel is ultimately a parody of American, African, and European presidents and political leaders and an expose of the hypocrisy and exploitation genera generated by colonialism in Africa. There are many, not many books that I read and I laugh aloud. 
And I was laughing aloud as I was reading uh, the minister primarily. So I encourage you to experience this for yourself. And please be sure to read Ishmael Reed's foreword. You will, as always, receive from Ishmael Reed an education on killings and his place in literature, the range of his works, and the politics of publishing Black literature. Thank you once again for joining us and for your support. And stay tuned for a stimulating discussion on the legacy of John Oliver Killens and what his message has meant for us historically and what it means for us today in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. We will begin the evening with a reading from the minister primarily from Arthur Flowers, and we are in for a treat. Let me tell you something about Mr. Flowers. Arthur Flowers is a native of Memphis, author of novels, creative nonfiction, and graphic works. He is a blues-based performance artist, Delta Griot. His latest work is the Hoodoo Book of Flowers. I have to get it. It's on Root Work Press 2020. He has been executive director of various nonprofits, a webmaster of Root's blog professor, emeritus at Syracuse University, and a practitioner of literary hoodoo. I really want to find out what that's all about. I want some hoodoo. Arthur? Mm -hmm. Am I up now? Flowers of the Delta Clan, flowers in the line of old killings. Baba John Killings, the great griot master of Brooklyn. And we have gathered here this evening to sing his praise. And when my people gather together like this, in peace and love and harmony, then that place, that gathering place, that place, it is the holy ground. And we have gathered around the sacred fire to partake of the visions without which the people will perish. start at the beginning when Jimmy Johnson arrives in Africa. And he is taken off the plane of a case of mistaken identity and accused of being an assassin until he tells them he is an African American here to find his roots. And they are pleasantly surprised and they welcome him home. They say, welcome home, my American brother. Welcome home. They shook his hand, they embraced him, they kissed him on each cheek. They said, Yuhuru. And he laughed and wept and laughed and wept while tears spilled down his cheeks until they finally joined him.
and there was a rumbling of thunder overhead. And he said, my guitar, my guitar, my guitar is on that plane. As he heard a airplane winging southerly to Lagos a thousand, thousand miles away, my guitar is on that plane. The cops and the immigration people could care less. But they did dig some Jimmy Johnson. He, they gave Jimmy a 24-hour visa. And they took him home with them. And they had a party. They had a party. And he had a natural ball. And everybody gathered for the party eating ground nuts stew, singing and dancing and drinking scotch and palm wine juju. And Jimmy had never felt better about anything in all his life. Not since the day he made his great escape from way down yonder in the Delta. And his, his, head was reeling with the spirit of belonging and a little of that palm wine juju. When Jaja said we had better get back to the airport, we got 15 minutes. So Jimmy, he shook hands all around and they wished him safe journey and gave him gifts of cola nuts and beads and amulets. And then they put him in a car and they took off for the airport in a cloud of dust and gravel. But when they got to the airport and rushed on to the field, they saw the plane taking off. taking off into the black, black African night. When night has fallen, it is really, really come down over, over Mother Africa. And with such a beautiful black, awesome, bloody vengeance, down on Mother Africa, you can hear night falling everywhere. On the ride back from the airport, the countryside leaped with the sounds of African night. A jam session of ad-libbing crickets locusts and all kinds of bugs. But it was the honking frogs, who that? Who that? Upstaged every living thing in this crazy African orchestra. Who that? And the smell of wood smoke from the villages along the countryside and into the forest, assaulted Jimmy's nostrils and his soul and reminded him of a thousand early wash day Monday morning in Lollipop, Mississippi, when he was a little boy before the washing machines and detergents were available to colored people. The days of oxygen soap and scrub boards and fires crackling under the black wash tubs. A funny but familiar 
feeling came into Jimmy's mouth and his soul, a quiver in his stomach as a wave of pure nostalgia almost overwhelmed him. Don't kid yourself. You are not, you are not missing Mississippi. You are feeling the welcome of Africa. Welcome home. Welcome home. Now when my people gather together like this in peace and love and harmony, then that place, that gathering place, this place, this place, it is the holy ground. And we want to welcome you this evening to participate in this thing we do, this celebration of the word. When my people gather together like this, May your days be full of passion. May your lives be full of grace. May your work serve many generations. May God's blessings be. May God's blessings be. May God's blessings be. God's blessings on us all. In the name of Baba John Killings, the great real master of Brooklyn. God's blessings on us all. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Mr. Arthur Flowers. I think we have just witnessed literary hoodoo. <laughs> Thank you so right. much. That was just wonderful. So now we will introduce the remaining panelists so that they can begin this discussion on the minister primarily. first writer, author that I will tell you about is Malaika Adero. What a wonderful woman, scholar, person. I know her. And she also has history with John Oliver Killens. Malaika Adero is the author of Vice President Kamala Harris, Her Path to the White House. A Black woman did that. 42 boundary breaking, bar raising, world changing women, and up south, stories, studies, and letters of this century's African American migrations. She has held editorial positions in publishing for 30 years and more than 18 years at Simon and Schuster. In 2015, she became an independent book developer working with emerging talent and big influencers, including Walter Mosley, everybody knows him, and Colin Kaepernick, we need to give him thanks. And she collaborated as a writer with Jennifer Lewis on her memoir, The Mother of Black Hollywood. Good evening, Malaika. Good evening, how are you? Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Arthur, brilliant. Thank you. Our next guest panelist is S. Pearl Sharp. Now, talk about firsthand witness. S. Pearl Sharp was a member of John Oliver Killen's Writers Workshop, where she birthed her first stage play, The Sisters. As filmmaker, author, and poet, her work includes the documentary, The Healing Passage, Voices from the Water the nonfiction Black Women for Beginners, I could use a little bit of that, and her new poetry video, Blood Bank, I got to get that, 
Her essays and commentaries have been heard on NPR and Pacifica Radio. S. Pearl Sharp welcomes collaborations on her poetry with jazz and short fiction. And I love this. She said, we'll write for chocolate. Welcome, S. Pearl Sharp. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this incredible family. Thank you. Looking forward to this. Our next panelist is Dr. Keith Gilliard. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilliard, in advance for all the books you've written about John Oliver Killens. Born and raised in New York City, Dr. Keith Gilliard began publishing his work in the early 1970s when he was taking writing workshops in the Langston Hughes Library in Queens. His poetry volumes include the recently published impressions, New and Selected Poems, 2021. He received American Book Awards for Voices of the Self and John Oliver Killens, A Life of Black Literary Activism. He helped launch the National Black Writers Conference and Syracuse University. Dr. Gilliard is currently the Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of English and African American Studies at the Penn State. Welcome, Dr. Gilliard. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Diane. You're going to get me to join the Harlem Writers Guild with all that enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> We would, oh wow, we would just be on the floor if you joined yeah, yeah. us for a meeting. <laughs> so, um, and our last panelist, I think, I don't want to make no mistakes now, it's been going good, Ishmael Reed. Now, he wrote the forward to the minister primarily, is the author of more than 30 titles, and I'm a big fan including novels, plays, poetry, and nonfiction. Reed received the University of California at Berkeley's Distinguished Emeritus Awardee for the year 2020. His new poetry collection, Why the Black Hole Sings the Blues, Poems 2007 to 2020, was released in November 2020. Archway Editions released Reed's play, The Haunting of Lynn Manuel Miranda. Audible released two audiobooks, The Fool Who Thought Too Much and Malcolm and Me. The Terrible, the, the, the Terrible Fours, the third novel in his Terrible Trilogy, was recently published by Baraka Books. Welcome, Ishmael Reed. Thanks. I, I really have to apologize to Malaika because. I go too rapidly on that Google. <laughs> <laughs> My fingers are on that thing all day. And I got you mixed up with the actress. <laughs> some of the names, so I regret that. <laughs> so that uh, the fool who thought so much might be my autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to be on Keith, who wrote the definitive book, the great book. <laughs> and out the flowers, you're keeping that stuff going, man. Yeah. Thank you, though. Well, you, you the model, brother. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, thanks for thanks for the intros, uh, Diane. I think we're going to get to it uh, in a second. I just uh, want to say a couple of things prefatory. Uh, thanks for everyone for thanks everyone for participating. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone for logging in, and uh, those books that uh, Diane mentioned, uh, why the uh, Ismail's poetry book and the Terrible Fours. I read them both. Uh, this summer. So yeah, if you can get get to both of them. And uh, I can't do anything involving Mega Evers. Any event at Mega Evers, I, I have to remember the uh, 14 years I was on the faculty there uh, with two of my, my mentors. Uh, Ismail is a guiding light, but I also had two members of, on the faculty with me who were mentors. And that's, that's Steve Cannon, uh, who I will never forget, and Ar Arnold Kemp, uh, who I, I will never forget as well. So I just wanted to get that out there. Uh, hi to Barbara Killens in case she's uh, watching, which I assume she is, uh, and any other members of the uh, Killens clan. Uh, I want to get out the way and let the panelists get to it because we don't we don't have we don't have all that much time. Uh, the time goes by quickly, but I just want to offer a couple of framing remarks. Uh, as you know, uh, 34 years after his passing, 
uh, we have this uh, new publication uh, by John Oliver Killens, which adds to his canon. Uh, and so what I want to hear from panelists is what they think it adds to his legacy, right? So we have addition to the canon, and then we can discuss what addition that is to his legacy. Uh, John, as was mentioned, that the novel was written in the 1960s. I believe it was, be it was begun uh, in the 1960s, but it stretched over the 60s, 70s, and on into the 80s. And if you look at some of the points in the text, you can, you can, you can some of the references are to the 80s uh, and some of the references to the 60s and the 80s, the time doesn't quite sync up. So you can tell that he was working on it over, over a long period of time. Uh, and finally, you know, it's, it's being published now. In 1961, uh, John took two trips to Africa. Uh, in the course of, he was working on a documentary uh, for I think it was a British uh, company. It was uh, they had proposed a documentary under the auspices of the American Society of African Culture uh, for a, doc a thirteen part documentary on West Africa. And so during those two trips in 1961, he put in over 12,000 miles on the Land Rover and visited I think it was 11 or 12 African nations. So that's the context. So when you look at the minister primarily, where so much of it is, is, is written in reference to Africa, including names of cities and, 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 and things like that, I think that the inspiration, the framing inspiration for that novel comes out of those two trips, those two voyages to Africa in 1961, uh, and a lot of the people that he met there, plus some of the African officials that he used to host at his home when they visited the US, uh, like, uh, like uh, Mr. Maki, who ended up marrying uh, Maya Angelou, and Oliver Tambo, who was with uh, uh, African National Congress. So that's where the name Oliver Mackey comes from. It's, it's a coinage of Oliver Tambo and and and, and Basumzi Mackey. So that's just the, that's just to frame it. Uh, in terms of my own opinions and whatnot, I have I have written comments, uh, so we can find those. I can mention those later for you. But my thing is to get to the panelists, uh, and I thought that because Ishmael wrote the forward. Uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I thought I would start with him and have him uh, just speak, give his impressions on, uh, maybe reiterate some of what he wrote in the forward and, and his general impressions of John and his legacy. Well, I would say that uh, this is probably the last <clears throat> published novel of the World War II generation. That includes uh, Johnny Williams and William Denby, I published his book, King Commas, <clears throat> and he had the same experience with publishers that uh, John had. And uh, William Gardner Smith's book, The Stone Face, another veteran, his book has been released. And uh, I think a connection can be made between John Oliver Killens and Charles Harris, who founded Amistad who was also a veteran of World War II. So I think this is a generation that's, that's uh, you know, made their testimony. And uh, John A. Williams' book, Clifford's Blues, shows, shows you some of the, some of the problems that uh, <clears throat> these writers had with publishers because they were ignorant of the Black experience. And my, my first encounter with uh, Charles Harris was in the Herald Tribune many years ago when he was actually educating uh, New York publishers about the Black experience. People who didn't know that Blacks fought in the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, and other places. Uh, and John A. Williams had problems with Clifford's Blues because they did not believe that Blacks were in concentration camps. So Clifford's Blues is about an African-American who gets by in a concentration camp because the Nazis love jazz, okay? Uh, so he had to convince publishers of that and he had to convince uh, book reviewers. So I think the idea is that mainstream publishers don't like international uh, or novels with an international scope by black writers. They wanna pigeonhole you uh, in, you know, different like, so, so like inner city novels or genre novels about the black experience. Paula Marshall had the same problem because she was international. She could write about the Caribbean 
as well as uh, scenes in the United States. That's the first point. The second point is that uh, <clears throat> just like uh, Baldwin's uh, Veal Street Could Talk, and also his final one of the novels that got him in trouble, uh, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, uh, there's a disillusionment over what all the hopes of the 1960s. Uh, Baldwin bemoans the, the fact that Malcolm and King and others were killed. And John O'Killen seems to be in this novel complaining about the failures of uh, African independence. So the French and the English and other uh, uh, European nations never really left Africa. They're still there. And I mean, you, if you keep up with the international news, you always read about France going in there, changing governments and different uh, Francophile nations. Uh, and so they're still there. Uh, Nkrumah was murdered, uh, or not murdered, but actually he was overthrown by the United States. Patrice Lumumba was murdered by the Belgians in the United States. The Belgians finally admitted it. And so they really changed the course of independence. And you can get that feeling that, uh, as Askia uh, Torre told me, he believes that the African leaders are like what he called pork chops. And Hugh Masekela said, you can buy one of them for a billion dollars. The idea is to free the president. All you have to do is free the president, give him a billion dollars. And so that kind of disillusionment is also uh, in this novel. Uh, he always has this thing about the middle class. Also in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, Young Blood and in uh, this book, there's this satire. I mean, he's, he goes beyond Fraser. You know what I mean? He's like, <laughs> way, way beyond. <laughs> for the middle class, I mean, it's all over the book. And he satirizes him uh, sometimes very viciously. And he also goes for uh, phony, like BS, uh, black nationalist politics. That's also satirized. I think the bottom line for Killens is that he liked the real and was opposed to the fake. And that got him into trouble. He's outspoken. I'm looking at that FBI report. I got it right here, where the FBI followed him from 1941 to 1973, both uh, the family, I mean, his wife as well, they'd open their mail and all of that. And so I think that uh, John O'Killens was a little too much to handle by the establishment. I'm reading this thing today in the Times, this fake thing here, it says books on race are bestsellers with more on the way. Hmm. Mm -hmm. No fiction titles mentioned here and they got one poetry title, one, only one poetry title, Call Us What We Carry by Amanda Gorman, who's a big Hamilton admirer. She admires Hamilton, and so does Michelle Obama, even though Hamilton sold a black woman in her child. I, I don't want to go into that. <laughs> Leave that alone. But uh, I think this is like a phony signal here, and that this kind of life coaching book that's being sold now to the sellers and the salesmen and publishing is like snuffing out poetry and fiction. So if you look at the poetry bestsellers on Amazon, Rita Dove comes in at 99. 99, Rita Dove. And if you look at the bestsellers in uh, fiction, you got to go all the way down to get Nella Larson, get a decent, I, I look at this other stuff, looks like Hollywood stuff, Harlequin stuff to me or as Elizabeth Nunez calls them, girlfriend books. But you have to go all the way down to get uh, to uh, Nella Larson. So I think the salesmen have taken over. And uh, that's why uh, John O'Killen's book doesn't get that kind of traction. Now, one more, one more point. And this is going to sound like a little nativist. The Jewish critics used to be, in the 50s and 60s, the overseers of Black literature. They have been replaced by the British and the British diaspora. Do you understand? They've been brought, the establishment has brought these people in here to like be the patter rollers of black literature. So you got somebody from Bangladesh, you know, reviewing books by a black American author, or in the case of Killens, 
They got somebody from England to review the minister primarily. Somebody from England who works for this uh, sort of like right-wing magazine, The Economist. You, I don't know if you saw that in the Times. Did anybody see the review? And then to second her review, they got somebody who lives in Abuja, Nigeria. And I try to, I've, I was, had talks with Pamela Paul of the New York Times. And I said, you know, you have, there are all these black critics who spent their lives studying black literature and they're in the Negro League still. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the people who know the least about black literature, literature seems to be the ones who are doing reviewing. But anyway, I think it's an excellent book. It's a book that you can use in any uh, creative, creative writing classroom to, you know, study uh, Johnny uh, Johnny Killens, John O'Killens uh, techniques. Okay, thank, thank, thanks, Ishmael. Uh, I'm gonna throw it to uh, Malaika or, or or Pearl, either one, uh, for you to get in. Uh, when he's talking about publishing, that made me think of you, uh, Malaika. But uh, you or or as Pearl Sharp, either one would be fine. Uh, Malaika, go ahead, girl. What do you, uh, Keith? What exactly do you want me to comment on? Uh, just uh, well, impressions. Um, maybe your own your own interaction with John. Um, yeah. What you think? What you think, the, what you think the minister primarily contributes uh, to his yeah. legacy, if it does? Yeah. 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 Well, it, it just um, I, I met John. The work of John. I was introduced to. Um, by his activism and his nonfiction writing, uh, particularly the, the long essay wanted uh, some black long distance runners that was published in Black Scholar, right? Mm -hmm. At that time I was at the, working at the Institute of the Black World in Atlanta and it was required reading. So that was my introduction to John before I ever got to the fiction. Then Tony K. Bambara introduced me to John Killens, the man I was a, a producer and script writer at Atlanta Public Library, Cable 5. And um, so there were two reasons for her introduction. One, if John is in town, he must be acknowledged by the library. He must be interviewed by the library um, uh, TV station. And I was the one to do that. And then on a personal level, it was a part of what uh, um, cultural activists do is create community. So this is how I become uh, um, a mentor uh, of John. At the same time, I was moving to New York to attempt to get a job in publishing. And so I did that rather quickly. This is in 1984. So John became my mentor in the day to day. I was one of those young people like Arthur Flowers who was attending his workshop on Saturday. And he was my mentor in terms of publishing. As it turned out, um, uh, his editor at New American Library, Carol Hall, became my first boss in publishing. So, you know, what, what um, Brother Ishmael says is, is, you know, is all true uh, about publishing. Um, there is uh, willful ignorance of Black people that has run rampant in pu uh, publishing. Publishing is the oldest and the slowest and the most conservative in many ways of media. The mm -hmm. good thing about publishing is that it's the, it's the freest medium for black people because you can say anything in the pages of a book. You know, the, 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 the racism, the sexism is so deep, deeply ingrained um, uh, in publishing that that you don't see it all on the surface and all kinds of things cover it up, including the concept of, of marketability, okay? Mm -hmm. So in some respects, the literature of the World War II generation was going to go in decline because every generation's creative voices go in decline. You know what I'm saying? People were mm -hmm. gonna turn away from a kind of style that, that John was writing in and some other males because a kind of um, black and, and female literature emerges as we're emerging, meaning we in this instance, uh, um, women and, and black women, you know, it is 
uh, women mostly buy and read fiction. And even in, in, in Black intellectual, Black cultural activist realms, there, there's been a bias against fiction. Poetry, you know, gets a nod, you know, but it, poetry has always lived on the periphery of the publishing industry. So, so not to go into that too long, of course there's a systemic racism. Of course there's a generational difference. I'm thrilled that Minister primarily comes back now because we are kind of in a full circle moment and it is so revelatory of what was happening then and how it's linked to what's happening now. Uh, and I'll pick up on what, Mal what Mal Malaya Kia, I'm sorry, sister, Malakia just said about style because when I started reading the book, it was like, like when you go home or go to your favorite aunts and she fixes that dish for you that you haven't had in a long time that you used to love. And it brings back all the memories of when you used to get that dish. And I realized I had been kind of missing Killen's style without realizing it. Yeah. So that, that way he has with satire and those, those uh, razor blades he pulls out, uh, mm -hmm. both on the white establishment, but also on us. Uh, and the way he does it so quickly I had just, I hadn't, you know, been reading that in a while and, and it was like coming home to that dish, you know, that you, that you really missed and didn't realize it till somebody you know, put it in front of you. One of the things about the legacy for this book is that it ties very strongly into his mantra, which you mentioned, and that is the long distance runner. And his, it was like a mantra because he talked about it all of the time. And I, I actually have the black scholar piece in front of me. And he said, black people live hand to mouth existence and our planning for liberation tends to be from hand to mouth. But hand to mouth planning will not win the human race, will not topple this capitalistic white supremacy establishment. And he's writing this back in the 70s. And he talked about our, our need, like the runners to not just run the 100 mile and the 200 mile, to, but to hit that, that, long, um, that long mileage and to build 100 and 200 year institutions. And so one of the things that um, the, the center is doing is being that institution. You got about 85 years to go, Dr. Green, <laughs> to get to that first 100. Uh, but I think that, that is part of what he's also saying in here. And, and I love that he is attacking what you said, Ishmael, that colonialism never really ended. And I think that it, it will help make Black Americans recognize that it never really ended. And you know what we see on the news at night, it, we, we have to interpret that. And, you know, and lastly, I would like to speak to that whole class thing, uh, mm -hmm. John being, you know, uh, for the people is that, and, and, and like um, Pearl just said, you know, I love being reminded of how in dialogue, the work of John Oliver Killens is with Tony K. Bambara, because mm -hmm. I think they, 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 they had a few things in common including their, their brilliance at hearing and conveying black speech and the voice and speech of regular folk and, and not shying from presenting black people in you know, their, their light side, their dark side, their shadow side, their good side, their bad side, inside the movement per se and outside the movement. I've been rereading the Seabirds um, are still alive. And, and the short stories like um, The Apprentice, which is set in the world of the activism, speak to that. You know, the cotillion, of course, um, speaks to that. So I think that they were br brilliant at that, not only because they had a good ear for dialogue and listened to people, they loved Black people and they loved all Black people you know, along in, in our economic diversity. Thank you. I think also- let's, 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 merge, let's merge Arthur in here. I mean, uh, after all, he, Arthur's the only one who was actually mentioned in the minister primarily. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look on page 407, which I mentioned to him that uh, Arthur Flowers is mentioned as the up and coming, up and coming guy. Uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, let's, let's, hear, <laughs> let's, let's hear from you, Arthur. <laughs> uh, hear what exactly? Uh, uh, you know, perspective on uh, the contribution. Uh, this work is possible. Uh, it's possible. We, like I said before, we know it, it, it contributes to its canon, but in what ways do you think it contributes to its legacy? And and maybe your personal connection with John as well. Why did you get to be in the book? 
I, I followed John from school to school for 16 years. Uh, I, I came to, he was at Columbia uh, in 73. And, and I had heard Nikki Giovanni told me when I asked her, are there any workshops in New York? She said, John Killens is at Columbia and his workshop is always open to the community. And uh, so I, I told all my friends, I'm going to New York, I'm gonna get in John Killens workshop, I'm gonna get a Nobel prize and I'll be back by the fall semester. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it didn't work out. I got to uh, New York and, uh, and John was in China. So I had to decide, am I going right back home? Or am I going to stay? And I stayed and I came to that first workshop and S. Pearl was there. I'm pretty sure because that's where I met you. Yeah. Um, and folk like Wesley Brown, Rachel Christmas. And, uh, and, and B.J. Ashanti. Uh, and these became, these are folk, as Adaro will tell you, that, I mean, we became family. We, we fathered, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we became family. Um, and, um, and we followed him from school to school until he got to his final resting place at Medgar Evers. And, and I used to call Medgar Evers the meeting ground because there were all these diasporic dynamics happening. And John was like the grill of the meeting ground. It, um, and so anyway, I'm always, man, to see a new book, any of John's works, I'm tickled. Um, I'm tickled. Oh, man, I remember every Saturday, we'd be waiting for him at the door and he'd come out and he'd walk all slow, man, and we'd be like little ducklings, you know, following <laughs> Mega Evers. And he would always walk. It was only a couple of blocks. Anyway, um, so I'm glad to see this book come out. I don't think it's his best book. Um, it, it, it's, it's a good book. It's a good book. But, but we, I remember when he started this book, and he would bring it to workshop, and we'd be like, I think that if he had been allowed to, to, to I don't, uh, 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 it, 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 it's, man, it has all of his strengths, but it also has his weaknesses. Um, and the weaknesses that he hammered into us not to do, <laughs> overt politics. He hammered, man, because we were all political. And he would like, you cannot let politics carry that now. Okay, okay, let, let me not go there. Um, I, I'm glad this book came out. I'm glad to see uh, uh, his, his, his legacy rounded out by this book. I, I don't think that it will change the impression that the literary world has of John, which is what I would like for it to do. There are those of us who have dedicated our lives to nurturing John's mythology. And this book will help. And for that, I am thankful. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, one of the things I'm struck by is, is the current uh, cultural moment as the minister primarily uh, appears and uh, as as Arthur did you know I heard some of this uh, when it was in preparation he used to read he used to read excerpts back in the 80s to us you know at, at, at Mega Evans College uh, but I'm struck that uh, uh, some of the people out in the audience might not know the, the, the central plot so I'm gonna summarize that real quick uh, there was the discovery of Cobanium uh, it's like the most precious element there is uh, in uh, Republic, uh, the small Republic in Africa. And so naturally the superpowers are trying to get in on it uh, to see who will get to exploit uh, the Cobanium. Uh, if this sounds like Black Panther, mm -hmm. that's something to think about, right? The Cobanium, the Vibranium, but, but, but John was on the Cobanium. This was way back in the, in the 60s, you know, so when he started thinking about that. So uh, I don't know if the vibranium idea comes from that, but the Cobanium, the Cobanium idea has been around 
uh, for a long time because John was working with it for a long time. Uh, so anyway, uh, the United States gets the first crack at trying to persuade uh, the nation to cooperate with it. And of course, they're worried about uh, the Soviet Union also getting a crack. And so there's that Cold War playing out uh, between the US and the Soviets. And so the first trip, as I said, they get the first crack. So the trip is planned uh, to the US, but there's a, an uprising uh, in the nation. And so it's decided that uh, the prime minister could not make the trip at that moment, but they didn't want to cancel the trip. And so they decided to uh, do the trip anyway with Jimmy J that Arthur talked about uh, in his, in his, in his warm-up or, or prelude uh, to the panel. He's a, he's a, a doppelganger uh, for the prime minister. And so they use him to do the tour of the US. And so most of the tour, until the very end of the novel, most of the tour of the US is, is, is with Jimmy J in the role of uh, the prime minister. So that's where the novel gets his title from. Uh, the minister primarily. Uh, I'm with Arthur, you know, glad to, glad to see the appearance of it. As I said, I have, if you go to my blog, uh, you'll see that I have remarks about uh, the minister primarily that I published years ago. Also got remarks about Ishmael's terrible force too. So you go to my blog, you see all that and his poetry, which is great. So uh, you see all that, but I'm just struck by the moment. The uh, Also the sort of the, the coming to America remake in the movie, sort of the coming to the coming to America moment. It has a lot, of, it has some of the flavor of that coming to America. So I went to check the dates and uh, John passed away in 1987, uh, October 27, and coming to America came out in 1988. So we know that coming to America didn't influence John. Uh, so we see some of that, we see some coming to America overtones uh, throughout the minister primarily. So, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, just as, as, as way of comment, it's long, uh, getting back to, uh, what Arthur said, I mean, uh, it's, it's, the novel is 400 and actually it's over four, it's over 460 pages. That's a, that's, that's a long, that's a long novel. Uh, so just preliminarily, I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm not an expert on, on, it, on, on, on style or technique, but it seems that that's a long, that's a long canvas. Uh, that's a large canvas on which to tell the story. So I would just say that any, any, uh, do we have other, other remarks from the panelists? Keith, would you speak a little bit about the person, the, the editing process, who edited uh, the book and how uh, that- As far as that? I know, uh, as I said, it was, it, it was a little amusing to me when I first, when they first started promoting and they was talking about the, 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 the long lost or the long, the long lost or the newly discovered novel, you know, by John Oliver Killings. And I just chuckled because I have the manuscript <laughs> and I've had the manuscript, I've had the manuscript on my desk for, for at least 12, 11, 12 years. So it wasn't lost. We had it. It just wasn't published, right? Uh, from what I understand, uh, and the person who gave it to me was Luis Reyes Rivera, uh, John's son-in-law, uh, Barbara's husband. And he gave me a copy of it and he edited it. And so he went over it. I don't think he, I don't think he was trying to do a, a deep uh, substantive uh, edit. I think he was just looking at like sentence level stuff like, you know, sentence level uh, things. And so he, he did an edit and that's the version, that's the version that he gave to me uh, years ago. It was Lewis who, who, who did the edit on it. And that's, a, that's a, and, and then when the, uh, as Brenda mentioned in the opening, you have a, a, a I didn't notice, uh, I think she said uh, Bass was the name, I guess at the editor at, at Amistad, I guess he edited it once it got in house uh, but I don't have any, I don't have any knowledge of that process or what he, or how he went about it or what he did. Did he do cuts or I don't, I don't know. I would have to, uh, I would have to take the original, the manuscript that I have, I would have to compare that against the published book for me to, for me, and I haven't done that yet. Uh, again, you're working with 460, 70 pages. It's hard to do that point by point hmm. comparison. So I haven't done that yet. Uh, but I don't, I don't sense there was a heavy editorial hand at all on the book. That, that would that would be my sense of it. You know, and, and actually I would hope that there wouldn't be mm -hmm. um, because I know myself, my approach would be to a, a posthumous writer such as John, um, you know, the same thing happened with uh, uh, Tony K. Bambara's last novel, Tony Morrison edited it, you know, uh, um, after Tony had passed they had a very close relationship. I would have a light hand on it. So I would err 
on the, uh, I, I would err on it being too long. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? At risk of cutting into to John's aesthetic. But, you know, you mentioned movies, um, you know, as an influence or, you know, or conversation or, you know, from uh, um, things stemming from John or things John did before subsequent generations. Also, one of the things that I didn't remember is how erotic John, uh, John's writing could be. Oh, you know, he had the humor <laughs> and the eroticism. Always. I was like, you know, I was, I was I did, worked on many, many books with, with Zane, you know, and in that category. And, um, uh, you know, he, he likely influenced that genre he heavily too, mm. you know. Um, John, it, it also shows me how flimsy are the barriers uh, uh, between genre, mm -hmm. you know, and the, and, the, and the usefulness or lack thereof as genre as a way of looking at storytelling and, and literature, you know, because it, he was funny, you know, satirical, the parody, uh, um, uh, he was erotic, he was political. You know, it, it, it was all of that, you mm -hmm. know, it was all of that. And, and, and John wrote with two, at least two different flavors in my mind, or that's how I saw him. It was John of the Young Blood, and then we heard the Thunder kind of novel, and then it was Cotillion mm -hmm. and the Minister yeah. primarily, you know, which are closer to each other, I think. But, you know, I did observe that too. Um, I love the play on words, and and sometimes uh, novelists of this generation and every generation, I guess, you know, can be so earnest in their view, mm -hmm. you know, and and consider their thoughts and ideas as so precious that they can't be funny, you know, or erotic for that mm -hmm. matter, you know what I'm saying? Because they 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 see themselves, you know, they're a little wound up. John wasn't wound up on the page in this case. And, and I remember him reading from the, the manuscript and process too. I mean, there are a million John-isms. Arthur can speak to that, the mm -hmm. language of, of John O. In that book, the things he would say, you know, the, the, the Duke of Ellington, what was that, that thing he would <laughs> say all the time? The Duke of Ellington, the Earl the of Pines. The, the Count of Basie, yeah, go through the, go through the uh, whole rundown. Yeah. yeah, the griot thing he would yeah. do. Now, mm -hmm. which Arthur is a, 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 a child of, or, yeah. or Minty of. Uh, Saint, uh, Saint, Harriet, Saint Harriet of the Eastern Shore. Yes, yes, uh, that was one of the favorites. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I would like to say something about the minister primarily, um, that, that it, it does, it, uh, you know, when folk ask me, they say, well, what did you do in a workshop for 16 years? And, uh, <laughs> And I tell him, I said, well, you know, first John taught us how to write, then he taught us how to be writers. Uh, uh, and, and he taught us how to promote and distribute and, you know, how to, 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 to be successful writers and how to maneuver through that. I remember he used to say, don't ever sell your name. That's all you got. Do not ever sell your name. I mean, I, I mean, those Johnisms, it's like I still hear them because I hear them so often. But, uh, but one thing that I tell folk is that after he taught us to be writers, he taught us to be visionaries. Uh, that whole long distance running thing, you know, which I translated as the long game. He he taught us to be visionaries, and he was a visionary. And I mean, and it, it, it I'm so often struck by the folk that by the fact that folk don't understand John's role as a visionary as a cultural visionary. And then I'm like, well, you know, it, it's not, it, you know, it, it wouldn't be a vision if everybody saw it. So, you know, uh, but what uh, I am really pleased with is that that vision is conveyed very well in the minister primarily. Uh, John is very prescient uh, in terms, because of the fact that he had this, I mean, it was John that made me understand that shaping generations is what writers do. And he, he did that. My, his most value to me was as a teacher. 
He was a teacher because he kept the bar very high and he didn't lower it for anybody. Um, he had a very simple rule for accepting critiques. One, you could not respond. You had to listen. Two, take notes. And three, go home, use what you can use and discard the rest. And so many of us have taken that, you know, those three steps and used them for ourselves and for people that, you know, we've been coaching or teaching because it works. It keeps you from defending. He was also the most generous person, not, not, I don't mean financially, I mean, all of the gifts and talents that he, he could give to us, whatever he could put into us and plant into us and grow us, that's what he did. And he, there was a, there's a restaurant in downtown Los Angeles called the Algonquin. And on Thursday nights, they would have braised turkey legs. And John loved their braised turkey legs. And so he would kind of put it out to the workshop that anybody, most Thursdays, just check with him first, but most Thursdays he'd be at the Algonquin and any of us were invited to come and join him for dinner. And we would just talk about whatever we wanted to talk about, the, you know, the current events, the literature, the piece we were working on. And those are the most wonderful moments because for myself, it was an opportunity to ask questions of John that I maybe felt embarrassed, you know, stuff I thought I should already know. I'd be too embarrassed to ask in workshop, but we could ask in these conversations sitting around the table. And when Wesley's book was about to be published, we talked a lot about the publishing process. So that kind of generosity, whenever Columbia University was closed, he would let us come to his house and we'd all sit on the floor. And when he was working Pushkin, you mentioned uh, Tony K. Bambara, she ended up editing Pushkin after he passed because you know, he had not finished that. And we'd sit around on the floor and he'd be reading Pushkin to us. And we'd probably have the same reaction when you were listening to, to the minister book um, that we weren't getting it all, but we were listening and he was expecting us to listen and give him feedback, you know. Yeah, I think part, I think part of that was, was, was John was uh, think, thinking of himself as passing the baton. Absolutely. Uh, you folks yeah. have talked about, you know, long distance runner, but he also, another metaphor he used was the relay. You know, so mm -hmm. this one passed it to that person, passed it to that person. And when John got his first yeah. contract uh, to publish Youngblood, uh, he, he was so excited, he took the contract to Langston Hughes' uh, home. Mm -hmm. And Langston had to calm him down. Langston calmed him down. <laughs> and then Langston had to, Langston started telling him about, same thing that Arthur's talking about. Langston started telling him about promotion. They'll promote you, they'll publish you, but you gotta, you gotta take charge of your own promotion. And Langston gave him a whole list of bookstores throughout the country, places that he could promote young blood. So mm -hmm. I think what he got from Langston, uh, he, was, he was conscientious about passing along. And that's one of the reasons he was a great convener. When you look back at these, we talk about the writers' conferences, uh, that one at Mega Evers in 1986, which had over 2000 people uh, attend. And I remember Ishmael was there, Arthur was there. I remember that. Uh, Arthur just had a book, uh, Arthur's book had just come out uh, in 86 at that conference, I remember. But if you go back before that, the writers' conferences that were held at Howard University in the 70s, uh, the writers' conferences that were held at Fisk University in the 60s, as well as <coughs> the 1959 writers' conference at, uh, that was held uh, in New York, uh, where Langston Hughes was the keynote speaker. John organized that as well. Uh, Julian Mayfield, other people like that were there. Uh, it's the conference that got first got Harold Cruz upset and he started writing. Uh, but Harold's criticisms began at that conference, you see. So he's in the middle, uh, John, I mean, his author saying, you know, cultural visionary, but also someone who was really in the middle of all that stuff. A lot of people, if you look at the roster of all the different writers who attended all those various events, uh, it's quite considerable, as well as the list of writers who published who were members of the Harlem Writers Guild. And that list is, is, is crazy. It's crazy long, so. The, the most memorable literary event I think I've ever been to is when John had a 20th publication anniversary party at his house for Youngblood, mm -hmm. the 20th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And if they had dropped a bomb on the house that night, they would have wiped out the, lit <laughs> New York, the literary of, of, of the United States wow. because people came in from all over the country. Mm -hmm. Julian was there, Maya Angelou, Mari Evans. Uh, I mean, you, people that we, and he invited the class. He invited his workshop to mm -hmm. come. And so we were able to meet, you know, I'm standing, Mari Evans was one of my idols and, and I'm in this conversation with her and I can barely talk because <laughs> you know, I was so excited. Yeah. But that was another part of his vision that there was no division between the students and the professionals. 
right. you know, because that's what he wanted us. He wanted us to become that professional. That house on what 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 street was that house on? Union, Union, Union Street. Union. 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 That house yeah. on Union. We had so many cultural. I mean, they were just man. We just John made himself a place where writers grow, and 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 between him and Miss Grace, boy, that house it, it was legend. It's still legend. Yeah. No doubt. Um, I think we have a, I think we're coming up on a, a, a quarter uh, to the hour and we were asked to leave questions for uh, people uh, writing in. Is that, uh, is Simone, is Simone doing that? Are you on, are you on, are you on the line, Simone? Or Diane? Yes. Is, Hello. Is, is, well, is what we will do is that segment of the program is going to be, the Q&A will be hosted by Clarence, okay. the director of the, the Center for Black Literature. However, before we go to that, I just want to thank all of you for this. This was firsthand knowledge of being connected with John Oliver Killens. It was just heartfelt. There were so many things you said, but uh, it's, it's um, thank you so much. I mean, I can't say it, we're short of time, but uh, it, 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 this was an event to witness and not miss out on <laughs> this, this sharing of information about John Oliver Killens in the workshop and uh, Arthur following him from school to school, um, the, the 20th anniversary at his home. Uh, um, uh, Malaika, I didn't know you were connected to him like that, coming to New York, just like uh, Maya Angelou for your first job. And Ishmael, your, your take on um, just the publishing industry really has not changed. Mm -hmm. And we must have confidence in our authentic black voices, and they must be reflective of our lives. And okay. it's a it's an uphill battle. And I can go on and on, but I will wrap this uh, up. Let <laughs> me round up. Yeah. So with that, one thing, I, one, one thing I will mention is uh, John used to talk to me about Ishmael. He he, he thought Ishmael was a great writer. So I'll just I'll end with that. Well, you know, you know, I think I think this novel is probably a tour de force in terms. Of, I don't know about the storyline. There may be some objections to that, but uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> building those scenes, that must have taken a lot of drafts because the uh, details of the interiors are uh, scrupulously uh, drawn, for example, in different uh, locales like the White House mm -hmm. and other areas, and the exteriors are great. Arthur Flowers, I think, hit upon a great point in both young blood and the minister primarily, the South is seen as a place for the authentic black person. Maybe I'm reading that wrong. And you could help, but also I think that's young right. blood and in the minister primarily, there's something about the South. And in Sippy, like, I think uh, also also in Sippy as well. Black soul uh, mm -hmm. lives. So um we will move on to the next stage and have introduce Clarence Reynolds, director of this for the Center for Black Literature. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, Arthur, Malika, Keith, Pearl, S. Pearl, and Ishmael. What a fantastic program. Uh, you guys, you guys and ladies did a fantastic job. Before I go into a couple of questions, I want to say. To all the attendees, thank you for attending this program. Uh, we're really thrilled about hosting it. Also, please visit the um, African American Literature Bookstore, aalbc.com, to purchase a copy of the book. I also want to extend, extend a thank you to our supporters for this program, Amazon Literary Partnership. And also, I want to give a thanks to Lawrence Jordan, who um, reminded us, who, who connected us, the Center for Black Literature, Dr. Green and I, with this, pro with this project. Uh, we have just a few questions. But one of the questions, I'm going to read one from the chat first, from the Q&A section first. And I'm encouraging people, if you have a question, to please send a question in. Um, one comes from Nathaniel Ostrowski. When we're talking about um, Don, John Oliver Killens and his cultural comments, she asked, 
which cultural norms should we shall we critique today? I'm sorry. She says, which cultural norm shall we critique today? I need more information before I could answer that. <laughs> okay. Mm. Well, if if she responds with more information, I will I will mm. pass that along. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe other folk. I, I, in, in case just, someone else has the question. Uh, I, no, I'm just think. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around that. There are all kind of norms one can right. critique. One can do whatever one wants to do with an I artist. Think black, you know, I think so. the black novel is going upscale. Mm -hmm. It's like Fannie Lou Hammer on the on the cover of Vogue magazine. <laughs> What, what do you mean when you say the well, black I think, novel I think, I think has the gone? I think the characters that you get in these novels are well off. Okay. In class. My mm -hmm. daughter just passed. She wrote a novel called Showing Out, my oldest daughter. And mm -hmm. she writes about the underclass of the underclass. The kind of characters that Richard Wright, <clears throat> Justin Himes, and those, that generation covered. But now I think people who are earning maybe uh, $100,000 a year, this is, seems to be the typical character. And... I want to mention uh, the other black girl. That's an example of what I'm talking about. This uh, novel is one of the most brilliant I've read in a long time. And she really goes into the kind of novel the publishers crave. And she also mentions in the novel, her character, that it's easier for a white author to get published, get material published about black life than black authors. Do, do you follow that? Mm -hmm. There's a mm -hmm. scene in a novel where the the editor, the character who's the editor, laments about the fact that uh, you know white authors get a better opportunity in telling a black story than uh, black authors, and with that in mind, Ken Burns, I'm critiquing Ken Burns on PBS, and he's put together this thing called uh, on Muhammad Ali, and uh, there's a lot of criticism I made of this because. Uh, he doesn't give credit to the Nation of Islam uh, for creating Muhammad Ali in the image. And as Abdul Rahman told me in my book, I wrote called The Complete Muhammad Ali. Without Elijah Muhammad, nobody would ever heard of Muhammad Ali. But Ken Burns has cleaned him up and made him the all-American boy and neglected to mention, for example, Ali's drift to the right when he began endorsing people like Ronald Reagan. So that's what I'm talking about, Ken Burns has all these people, all these uh, corporations, mm -hmm. yet there's nobody who's doing like The Greatest by Richard Durham, which is one of the great uh, books on uh, Muhammad Ali. I just want to put that in, you know, just mm -hmm. put it out there. Okay. Read the other black girl. It's got all the stuff that you want to talk about in publishing, the kind of books that are preferred, and the whole industry. And, and the other black girl is about a, a black woman who's an editor, they hire another black woman and they have to fight it out. It's sort of like a Pat Juber arrangement. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Darrow's probably got all kind of publishing. So. Well, I know she has stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she does. Um, <laughs> Dr. Green had mentioned, uh, she said you all talked, many of you have talked about John Oliver Killings' generosity. She, she just wanted to know, would you comment a little bit about his activism, his literary activism? Well, it's followed by the FBI. I'm sorry? They, they, he was followed by the FBI for many years, so there must be something to it. Well, you know, John was really, I mean, that was part of his overt training, was training us how to be activists and how to forge literary mobs and, and how to empower literary mobs and to be a literary mob. Um, and I mean, that the fact that I, back, I remember back in 73 when I, I, I remember, you know, the major voices were Baldwin, Ellison, uh, Walker, and somebody else I'm trying to think of. But none of them were as, as I mean, John was very part of his mission as a writer was to train young writers and be a space where writers grow and train. And like I said, he, you know, when it was time to, for us to learn promotion, he trained us how to promote, he trained us how to, 
have to be there for each other and be a literary mob. And we all are literary activists trying to forge our own as part of John's legacy. Right. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think one of the things, I think you have to look at his models also. Uh, Robeson, it all starts, it all starts with Robeson. He's, he's, everything is, everything is about Robeson. Robeson and his model, even his characters in several of his novels, they're based on Robeson. Uh, they'll be Robeson's height. They'll be Robeson's weight. They'll be, they'll be like Robeson. They'll be Robeson-esque. So he had a picture of Robeson hanging in, hanging in his home on Union Street, right? So. And, and he um, used to, and he yeah. used to jack us up in the workshop if we didn't know Robeson. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so you, mm -hmm. you have to look at that. You have to look at his model for integrity. Also in Langston. Was a uh, Langston is a model, but his model for integrity was Malcolm. That's why you see Malcolm in the Cotillion talked about, and you see him again in the minister primarily uh, talked about. And in terms of his own roots, uh, John was a student of E. Franklin Frazier. So not only is it that he talks about E. Franklin Frazier in the novel, he was, he was his student at Howard University. He sat in the class, John actually sat in sociology class, and E. Franklin Frazier was his professor. And the FBI started following John and E. Franklin Frazier at the same time. Like E. Franklin Frazier was called down one week and John was called down the next week. So I'm pretty sure that when E. Franklin Frazier was called down, then he, he and John talked about how to handle the interview when you go down. So this all happened at the same time. So when you understand his models, where he came from, Du Bois is obviously, uh, uh, he idolized Du Bois, but specifically hand to hand with Robeson uh, who he was sitting there with uh, and, and his models for integrity after that were Malcolm and Lorraine Hansberry. And he also, and you would know this better than I, but he also had Marx, some kind of Marxist training. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's where it all starts. <laughs> you know, he was the first, he was the first employee at the National Labor Relations Board. And so uh, if, you, if you know anything about the thirties, uh, all that stuff, it wasn't, it wasn't considered so bad, you know, back then, but all that stuff was floating in the air in the 30s in Washington, D.C., where he was. Uh, so clearly he, he, he was from a Marxist background. Uh, Paul Robeson Jr. can talk about that, but when I talked to Paul Robeson Jr., uh, their opinion was that John, he saw John as being part of an independent Black left. So he didn't see him as being controlled or obesant to the party in any way. So it, Marx's influence uh, but 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 with the flexibility and the independence, uh, he Sarah Wright, uh, other people like other people like that. It's interesting that because uh, you had mentioned Cox, and Cox was one of the few folk who kind of acknowledged John as a player, even mm -hmm. though he was criticizing John. And I and 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 you correct me if I'm wrong, Nike, um, but Cox was criticizing him because he was left, and and Cox was nationalist. But it's interesting that all of us who came and were drawn to John came out of the Black Arts Movement. We were all cultural nationalists. Yeah, I would say I would say he was mm -hmm. left national. I would say he was left nationalist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would say he was. Yeah, I'm saying I would say he was. Yeah, I would he, say he was, a hard he was time left nationalist. He gives up nationals a hard time in his novel. Yeah, yeah, I would say he was left nationalist. He, uh, but, there's, there's there's a constant thing about black. African nationalists being opposed to the real nationalists. Right. The real Af and Africanists. Yeah. There's that scene where they talk about the hairstyle. Mm -hmm. And the Black American nationalist says, well, you know, brother, why, why don't you do your hair like we do? You're African. And right. he tells them why. We're in the tropics and this and that. And tells them why he doesn't have that hairstyle. He was a complex guy. And, you know, the guys on the ladders, he satirized them. Mm -hmm. You know the guys on the step ladders near Michelle's uh, bookstore in Harlem. Yeah, but you, yeah, but you, yeah. you can see the politics in in the essay that uh, Malika and, and and S Pearl were talking about uh, that long distance runners essay. He's explicitly saying that those things won't dismantle a capitalist white supremacist patriarchy. So I mean, he laying he laying his, he laying his cards down on the table right there. So you know, you know what the politics were. And, and again, it was a primary text, one of the primary texts of the Institute of the Black World, which was mm -hmm. a consortium of activist scholars, you know, and, and he was regarded by people as a father of the Black Arts Movement, 
Um, it, you know, again, that's how Tony K. Bambara introduces me to him mm -hmm. as that. You mm -hmm. know, you must meet this father of the Black Arts Movement. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, again, it was in the community think, uh, activism. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think Addison Gale gave him that tag. Uh, regarding novelists, he, as Addison Gale called him the spiritual father of a new generation of black novelists. Ah, so, okay. yeah. mm -hmm. and, and, and clearly with hip, with, between John, because of the organizing and the conferences between John and Hoyt Fuller, uh, clearly these are these are two of the central figures that, that kept the black arts movement going. And, and those conferences were forces in themselves. Oh yeah. I mean, it, that they, they, just the organizing of them was organizing. Yeah. And still, I remember. I remember sitting at. I was on Arthur. You and I were on the panel at uh, in in 1986, and John John A. Williams was on our panel, and at that panel, he was telling the story about trying to write Clifford's Blues. Clifford Blues was elect, was rejected 56 times, 56 that's, times by publishers. That's novel. And he yeah, that's he was tell, yeah, he was telling he was telling the story. Of the the blacks in the concentration camp, and he was doing that at that at that conference. I remember that. Mm -hmm. now, well, you think, that you think was some of on that panel? You think that some of the black writers and spokespersons uh, would be Holocaust deniers if they knew that the original uh, experiments on genocide uh, practiced by the Germans took place in uh, Africa? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, in Namibia, they're asking for reparations now. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mingla's doctor, teacher, was there experimenting on, on black women, thousands of them, uh, in 1901. So uh, a lot of black people don't know that there were black Americans and Africans in those concentration camps. Right. We're, we're at the eight o'clock hour, and, I, and, and this was such a rich conversation. And I just wanted to give everyone a chance to say, do you have any lasting comments that you'd like to share with our, uh, with our, with our I, attendees? I would like to say quickly that um, once again, I, 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 I consider it anything, anytime one of John's books come out, you know, it, it, it's like a major cultural victory. So, you know, I really appreciate everybody who put the work in to make that book happen. Um, and I would also like to say uh, th that, it, 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 that that a lot of folk don't understand the role that John Killens has played, but his legacy, I mean, the fact that he trained generations of young writers, um, his legacy will be immeasurable. And this book is part of keeping that legacy alive and i would like to thank folks thing, thing about it i think i think there's one more uh what, what is that one i think there's one more man there's one more novel hmm. i believe i don't i'm not familiar I like the introduction you can tell yeah, us one more there's one more novel uh i I saw you it. You're going to just tease us up. No, I, saw, tell no, us? I, <laughs> I haven't read it actually. I saw it in the archives. I saw it in archives at Emory University and I asked Barbara about it. I thought because John was such a, a, a mentor to so many people and his name wasn't on the cover, on the cover uh, uh, sheet. So one of his students. I thought that maybe it was one of his students. He had a manuscript and whatnot. But in talking with his daughter, she tells me that he wrote that novel. And, so and there's one more. Did not hear his voice in it. I didn't read it. You know oh. what I'm because I, I didn't. I didn't think he. I wasn't. I didn't think he wrote it. So I didn't start reading it. So, but Barbara tells me it is his novel. So there's okay. maybe another event like this in the future. With with like I said with Ishmael Ishmael with another intro. Well, I gotta beat you to write the intro, Keith. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I want to thank you all for joining I, us. May I, may I say one more point, right? Sure, quick. absolutely. It, it's been so wonderful being on a panel with folk that I love, like I love you folk, um, and and just just been wonderful. And I mean, uh, uh, mumbo jumbo was the book that turned me out. You know. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Mine was, mine was the freelance pallbearers. That's the one that yeah, that's I, the one that I got, got me. 
I got one more statement. Mm -hmm. The World War II generation of novelists will never be forgive, forgiven for exposing the greatest generation as a lie. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah, and then we heard the thunder is his absolutely major work. Absolutely. Well, again, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank our attendees for joining us this evening. I want to let everyone know that this is the first of our John Oliver Killings reading series programs for this semester. Uh, we have another one coming up on September 30th. So you can visit our website and register for that one. It's called Black Women Writers at Work. Uh, that's going to be a fantastic panel. And then we have a, the John Oliver Killings series takes place the second Thursday of every month. And we are, have our program all lined up through the end of the year. And we also have the National Black Writers Conference that will be coming up uh, March the 30th through April the 2nd, 2022. So you can put that, you sh will be getting save the date notices um, in a couple of weeks, but you, please put that on your calendar. And the theme of it is the beautiful struggle. Is that virtual? Is that virtual? Uh, uh, we, we're still working on that, but it probably will be, we're not sure, but um, it will be uh, on that date. I mean, I'm sorry, we, we're still working on that. But um, it's, again, the theme is the beautiful struggle, Black writers lighting the way. That's our theme for this particular, for the um, 16th National Black Writers Conference. So um, getting to your question, Keith, we will let everyone know uh, if it's gonna be a virtual or hybrid uh, presentation. But again, I wanna thank everyone for joining. I'm sorry, as Pearl, you, had you were about to say something? No. Oh, okay. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. I wanna thank all the attendees. Uh, if you like our program, please visit our website, www.centerforblackliterature.org and hit the donate button so that we can continue bringing you programs like this that are free or of very little cost. Uh, any donation is accepted and welcomed. So um, please visit our website about our upcoming events and please make sure that you continue to um, make contributions to the Center for Black Literature so that we can continue with these with the John Oliver Clinton City series programs and the National Black Writers Conference. Again, I wanna thank my, our panelists. I wanna thank Dr. Brenda Green. I wanna thank Akila Work Songs, Samoa Wall Manning, Leah Bird, Amber Magruder, the entire staff at the Center for Black Literature. And I wanna thank our fantastic attendees for uh, who are supporters. I saw a couple of names. These folks show up at just about all of our events. So you know who you are. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. There's a poll. Um, that's popped up on the screen. We're asking everyone to please um, fill that out. We'd appreciate it to get some feedback. And thank you, Clarence, for you. hooking it thank up. You so thank much. you, yes. Oh, it was absolutely my pleasure, absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and Ms. thank you, yeah, and thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Diane Richards from the Harlem Writers Guild. You did a fantastic job. Arthur, man, that, that, that opening, that, that's what you call a dramatic reading. <laughs> that's, that's what that's that what was does. amazing. Thank you, Arthur. Thank and you. Uh, and uh, again, thank you, everyone. Have a very pleasant evening. And visit ALBC.com to purchase copies of The Minister Primarily. Thank you.